So turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue our verse-by-verse study through Matthew. Uh, As you know, that's one of the uh, distinctives of Calvary Chapel. We go verse-by-verse through whichever book we are in. We just finished going verse-by-verse through Genesis, and now we are going to uh, verse-by-verse in Matthew. When we finish Matthew, we'll go and do verse-by-verse through Exodus, and then Mark, and then hopefully the rapture happens before I get to Leviticus. (laughs) But we'll keep going and see what the Lord has for us. So as we've seen um, in Matthew chapter 5 up to this point, Jesus had thousands upon thousands of people following him, multitudes it says, and um, he was healing all of them. And he goes up on this mountain, and it's Mount, they call it Mount of Beatitudes, but it's above the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful, picturesque scene. And uh, he has all the people up there on this mountain. He begins to give them what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, he gave us what we saw as the Beatitudes, the first uh, 10, 12 verses here in chapter 5. And then he starts talking about. Uh, being salt and light of the earth. And he said, I didn't come to destroy the prophets or the law. I came to fulfill it, and only he can fulfill the law. And remember that because that is extremely important to the things that we're going to be looking at. We, we left off uh, looking at chapter uh, 5, verse 20, where he tells them, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, who are the most religious people in Israel, There's no way you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter. And so the people are probably very uh, discouraged by that. But we'll see why Jesus is setting this up. In the rest of this chapter that we'll look at this morning, Jesus will totally dismantle what these uh, Pharisees perceived as uh, righteousness that they had attained on their own, by their own efforts, by their own good works, And over and over again, we'll hear Jesus saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And he will give us the proper interpretation of God's law. And when he's done, the people will quickly realize that there is nobody who can keep the law if your intention is to try to make yourself righteous. It's that simple. So verse 21 is where we pick up. In Matthew chapter 5, you have heard it, heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. So that's what they were hearing. He quotes, this is commandment number 6 out of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. In other words, you shall not plan out how you are going to deliberately kill somebody. That's what the word there, murder, means. That's what it means in uh, the Ten Commandments, premeditated murder. There's seven Hebrew words for murder or kill. Some are justifiable, uh, accidental. Some are not justifiable. A justifiable killing would be David. King David, before he's king, killing Goliath, that was justifiable. Unjustifiable was King David killing Uriah. That was totally wrong because he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then he has uh, Uriah put to death by putting him on the front lines. So when Jesus says here, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. That's all that the commandment says. That's the only thing it says for the sixth commandment. But Jesus also quotes what the religious leaders added to that commandment. They said, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Now, that could be the case, but they left no room for repentance. They left no room for confession of sin. And so the religious leaders are going beyond what God's word said. Again, King David is a great example in the Old Testament that even though he committed adultery, even though he murdered Uriah, he found grace and mercy from God when he repented of his sins. That's what um, Psalm 32, Psalm 51 is all about. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And create there means to create something out of nothing. Hebrew is bara. And that's the same word as when God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. So David's crying, give me a brand new heart, God. I can't do this on my own. So he's the great example of God's grace and mercy, and he found forgiveness. He found restoration from God. So again, the Pharisees are going beyond what the Word says. Verse 22, So they said this, but I say to you, 
that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So Jesus clarifies that murder begins in the heart. So it's not you know, good enough to say, well, I've never murdered anybody, so I guess I'm good with God. That's what a lot of people try to do with the Ten Commandments. Oh, I've never committed adultery, so I'm good with God. He'll get into this in a moment. But even if you've been angry with someone, he says, without a cause, that means without righteous indignation, you're guilty of murder in God's eyes because he sees your heart. Righteous indignation, nothing wrong with being angry for a righteous cause. We are seeing over 60 million babies in our country aborted since Roe v. Wade. That should get you angry. That's righteous indignation. Now, you don't go blow up an abortion clinic. Then you're going beyond because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So there is that righteous indignation. But the point is, we've all broken the sixth commandment inwardly. We've all had anger in our hearts without a cause. We've been mad at people. I grew up in Southern California. You get in traffic, you, I invented road rage. Road rage. I mean, come on. So notice, even if you've called someone, he says, a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Why? Because the Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. So if you're going around cause, telling a Jew, there's no God, then you're in big trouble with God. You would be denying the fact that God can forgive, God can restore, God can heal. That's why Jesus says, you know, you're in danger here of hellfire if you tell your brother there's no God. And so in all these, we see that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Yes, outward actions are important, but whatever we do needs to come out of a pure heart, a heart that beats for Jesus. And we saw the very first thing Jesus said is, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So it starts off with, you have to recognize, first and foremost, you don't measure up. You fall short of the glory of God. And that's what poor in spirit means. You realize, I can't save myself. I need God. And that's the whole point of these things. So verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So before you come in here to worship the Lord, before you come in here to praise and seek God, get things right with the person that you're having issues with. Don't let it escalate to the point where you end up in court because you might get thrown into prison. But this is how exacting the law of God is. He says you can't get out of prison until you've paid back every last penny. In that time frame, you could not earn any pennies if you were thrown in prison. And so the law shows you you're stuck in prison. You can never pay it back. There's no way. But we're going to see later on, Jesus is our advocate. He paid the price in full for our debt to set us free from the prison of the enemy. Well, verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. That's commandment number seven, Exodus 20, verse 14. It simply says, you shall not commit adultery. So this refers to the act of committing sexual sin with another person's spouse. The self-righteous Pharisees and scribes would say, well, I've never done that. I haven't broken that law. But again, watch how Jesus deals with the heart. Verse 28, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, he says it begins in the heart. And the point is, everyone is lusted after someone in their heart. 
Now, even if somebody can make a strong case, well, I've never committed adultery, I've never committed murder, I haven't broken these commandments. The Apostle Paul points out the fact that there is one of the Ten Commandments that deals specifically with the heart. It's commandment number 10. And this is what uh, commandment 10 says, Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Man, I wish I lived in that neighborhood. I wish I had that house. I live in such a little place. Oh. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, You shall, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox. Man, look at that guy's pickup truck. I wish I had that one. I got a shabby old thing. Nor his donkey. They got a Lexus. Oh, man, I just got a Volkswagen. Whatever. Nor anything that is your neighbor's. So this is what Paul says about this commandment, Romans 7, verse 7. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not covet. So covetousness is definitely a heart issue. And the purpose of the law is to show us that we cannot save ourselves. It brings us to Christ, who alone can save us. And this is what uh, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. But Galatians 3, verse 24 and 25, Paul says, And again, if you're having any issues with yourself or with anybody else, usually if there's an issue, the issue is with you. So if you're having issues with that, that was stupid, I'm sorry. Galatians 3, 24, Therefore the law was our tutor, our instructor, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. By, but after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. You're not under the law. You're under grace. You're under Christ. You're in Christ, and He has fulfilled the law perfectly. So again, the law cannot make us righteous. It can only show us how unrighteous we are. Think of it like this. God's law is like a thermometer. And when it comes to being sick, a thermometer cannot cure you. A thermometer just tells you what your temperature is. And if it's 103, then you'll say, yeah, I'm sick. That's all a thermometer can do. I've never seen anybody say, you know what? If I try to swallow down this thermometer, I'm going to get better. It can't do it. It's not intended to do it. That's not what it was made for. And that's the same with the law. The same is true for the Ten Commandments. It can't cure you, let alone save you, but it tells us we're sinful. We're sick in our hearts. But it leads us to the great physician, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who can heal us and he can save us. Another way to look at the law is to see it as a mirror. When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, the mirror cannot fix the mess you see. It can't. Uh, what's the mirror for? It just lets you know what a mess you are. That's the primary purpose of the law. Now, if you still think that your sin problem can be dealt with physically by doing outward changes, reforming yourself, and you're thinking, my heart's really not that bad. Well, look at what Jesus says next, verse 29. If your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out. Your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand, verse 30, causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Again, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. If you think that lust and covetousness and anger can be overcome physically, I just pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, and see what that does for you. It won't do anything for you. You can cut off any other body part you want, and it's not going to help. I can't, running, I can't stop running towards these sinful situations. Well, cut off your foot. See if that helps. Well, I just got to stop listening to these horrible things I'm listening to. Well, cut off your ears and see if that helps. The problem with all of this is that every one of us would just end up being a mangled stump. We would. 
You can cut out your eyes. You can cut off your ears. You can cut off your hands and your feet. Cut your feet off first. It'd be hard without hands to cut off your feet. You'll just be a stump. You're not going to be able to do anything. And you guess what? Your heart is still going to be a problem. Because that's the whole issue. The good news is Jesus is the only one who can change our hearts. And he's been giving people new hearts for the last 2,000 years. Verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason, take note of that phrase, except sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. In these verses, Jesus is standing up both for marriage and for the woman, the wife. Now, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 24. This is where Moses spoke of the husband writing a certificate of divorce if he found out that she was cheating on him, or they get married and then he finds out she was not a virgin. Moses says, if he finds some uncleanness in her. Over the centuries, a problem developed over this whole situation concerning the interpretation of the word uncleanness. There's a rabbi by the name of Hillel, who was very famous in the time of Jesus, and Hillel basically said, uncleanness means anything the wife does that displeases her husband, he can write her a certificate of divorce. And so, that's what a lot of the, because you're in the flesh, you're like, my wife burnt breakfast. This is part of his list. My wife burnt the breakfast. So I, that displeases me. So I'm going to write her a certificate of divorce. My wife is angry at my parents. So I'm going to write a certificate of divorce. We'd all be divorced if that was the case today. Come on. In-laws, outlaws, the choice is yours. I mean, that's what they were doing. You know, she... You know, I woke up this morning, I decided she displeases me, so I'm going to give her a certificate of divorce. Now, obviously, that's not God's design for marriage. This simply reduced the wife to being a commodity instead of seeing her as a lifelong partner. And so here Jesus is putting the blame on the husband who treats his wife like this. By sending your wife away, you're causing her to commit adultery. I just saying, I don't want you. I'm displeased with you. Why is that committing, you know, not pleasing to the Lord? Because in God's eyes, that was not a valid reason for a divorce. She burnt your breakfast? You're still married. Now you're committing adultery because you got remarried to somebody else because they're not burning your breakfast. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Back then, women had very few options, and so they would do what they had to do for survival. And many times that meant they went into prostitution. And so Jesus is telling the husbands, you need to take your marriage seriously. Treat her as the daughter of God that he gave to you. Now, we know this is what was in Jesus' heart because he goes into greater details of these two verses in Matthew chapter 19. So look at these verses. We'll look at Matthew 19, starting in verse 3, where he expounds on the idea of marriage and divorce. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, so they're putting him to the test, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? So they're saying, oh, we agree with Rabbi Hillel. For any reason, you can divorce her. So is it okay? Is it lawful? If she displeases me, we can write her a certificate of divorce. The other basic school of interpretation was from a guy named Rabbi Shammai, and he took a much more strict approach to divorce. He says, only if there is adultery can there be divorce. Well, the problem with that is he's going... Too far with that idea, because if you were caught in adultery, what were the Jews required to do? Kill him. Stone him to death. This is when they brought the woman caught in adultery. Caught in the very act, it says. Brought before Jesus, thrown at his feet. Problem number one is, why, if they're caught in the very act, where's the dude? Why is it only the lady thrown at his feet? Where's the guy? And then they say, well, the law says we should stone such women. What do you say? In that whole scenario, he is without sin among you, cast the first stone because he's getting to the heart of the matter. So watch what Jesus says in 
Matthew 19, he straightens out their theology. Verse 4, he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made, ma made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they're no longer two, but one flesh. This is the mystery of marriage. God takes two imperfect people and He brings them together as one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man, or let not man, separate. In other words, Jesus is telling these religious leaders, don't listen to Shammai, don't listen to Hillel, and even go back before Moses. Go back to the Garden of Eden. That's God's ideal for marriage. One man, one woman becoming one flesh for life. So watch what the Pharisees now try to do to trap Jesus once again. Chapter 19, verse 7. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce to put her away? Wait, Moses never made any commandment. He didn't command them to write a certificate of divorce. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever, now this is where he's quoting what we're looking at in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, the same words. He says, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now let me point out a couple things that are significant here in these passages. First of all, back here in chapter 5, verse 32, when Jesus says, for any reason except sexual immorality, he uses the Greek word porneia for sexual immorality. It encompasses a lot of different types of sexual sin, not just adultery. Why is this important? Because in Israel's history, at this time frame, these Sadducees, Pharisees, these scribes, it was not uncommon for these guys to be married and divorced 10 or 12 times. We're not committing adultery. I just wrote them a certificate of divorce. Now I'm getting, it's like we call an annulment, the Catholic Church. Same thing. No, it's your way to get out of this by annulling it, even though you're still married in God's eyes. But they didn't even consider, you know, have, they didn't consider it adultery, these Pharisees, if you um, had a prostitute. If you brought home a slave girl to be part of your concubine, that's not adultery. No, we're just consenting adults. So they only interpreted adultery as a Jewish married man having an affair with a Jewish married woman. And so Jesus is saying, hold on. Any sexual activity outside the boundary of God's definition of marriage is sin, porneia. It's wrong. So Jesus is putting the emphasis on the man doing what's right. Over and above, the man just looking for an easy way out of the marriage. The Bible is clear. God hates divorce. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God says, I hate divorce. But he doesn't hate all divorce. But he hates unscriptural divorce. And he certainly does not hate divorced people. Now, even though divorce is not God's perfect plan, it is not the unpardonable sin. There are many examples in Scripture and in Christians' lives throughout the generations of divorced people. God breaking, uh, bringing broken pieces back together, doing a new work, doing amazing things in and through their lives once again. In fact, God himself is a great example of this when it comes to the nation of Israel. Did you know that God himself wrote a certificate of divorce to his wife? Who's that? Israel? This is what it says. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. Then I saw, this is God speaking, then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. Why were they committing spiritual adultery in God's eyes? Because they were worshiping and making pagan idols. 
worshiping pagan gods, praying to these things. But did God hate Israel forever? Absolutely not. He remained faithful to her. He has brought her back into the promised land. And a time is soon coming when all the Jewish people who survived the Great Tribulation will receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they're going to be brought into the kingdom of God, and it's going to be a glorious time in the presence of the Lord. That's going to happen at the second coming of Christ, when He returns in power and great glory and sets up the literal kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. We'll see that verse, Lord willing, next time in uh, the Lord's Prayer praying that these things would be done on earth as it is in heaven, setting up the kingdom of God. And so whatever your marriage status is right now, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, or you're divorced and remarried, the best thing you can do right now, today, is honor God, love your spouse, if you're, still, if you're married, and remarried, divorced, remarried, love your spouse, Love those around you. And Jesus is going to go on to say, and love those who are even against you for whatever reason. Well, look at verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. That's Leviticus 19, verse 12. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because, here it is, you cannot make one hair white or black. Well, again, before Grecian formula, or before whatever Colton Dixon did to his hair. Make it so white and whatever. But, verse 37, let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. For believers like you and me, an oath should not be necessary. Our yes should be yes. Our no should be no. In other words, as members of God's kingdom, we should be faithful and trustworthy. Our word should be good. You know, we should say what we mean. We should mean what we say. I'm sure we've all dealt with people like that. They say things, well, I swear I'll never do this again. I promise I'll never do that again. You can't imagine how many people over the last 31 years have come by the church asking for help. Oh, I promise when I get back to wherever they're going, because they always break down in Grand Junction, it seems like. I promise I'll get that check to you for whatever you do and buy me a new tire or whatever. I pro I've never seen a check from anybody from any other state once they leave here. Or they'll find out I'm a pastor. Oh, I promise you, pastor, I'll be at church next Sunday. Swearing falsely is the same as lying. Here he says that is from the evil one, Satan. He's a liar, the father of all lies. You know, it wasn't that long ago when all you needed was a handshake. Even as a kid growing up, my, that whole year, just like, handshake, that's good. Now you got lawyers involved, you got to sign everything, you know, you got to make sure you do all these things. <sighs> Not anymore. It, it seems like that it's getting harder and harder to trust people. But at the same time, we can always trust God. We can always trust His Word. His Word is sure. His Word is truth. What He says goes. Here's a great verse, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So we can count on the Lord. When He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'm with you always to the end of this age, you can take Him at His word. Because He's not going to say, you know what, I was only kidding about that, Jeff. You're in a hard time? Nah, I'm bailing on you. No, that's not the Lord. He is, yes, His promises in Him, amen, what He says goes. Now, it's interesting here in verse 37, uh, or verse, where is it, 35, where He mentions, nor Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. When Jesus says that, it's interesting because 
the Roman Empire. They were in authority over Jerusalem and Israel, the whole world at that time. So this is prophetic when Jesus says Jerusalem is the city of the great king because when Jesus comes back at a second coming, he's going to establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. There's going to be a new temple built by him called the Millennial Kingdom, and he will rule and reign from Jerusalem at that time. So it is the city of the great king. There is a coming temple that the Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to build, and that's going to be, it's, it's not a temple that's going to last because the Antichrist will defile it. And when Jesus comes back and he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and we're coming back with him, the mountain splits in two. And I think he's just going to obliviate that temple on the Temple Mount and the other obstacles that are up there, Dome of the Rock, the Mosque Alask, that's all going to be gone because the Temple Mount's going to be for the millennium much bigger. The temple's going to be huge, you know, a lot bigger than it's ever been. A memorial is what it's going to be. Anyway, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, uh, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. This is a saying known as the lex telianus. In other words, the punishment shall match but not exceed the crime. That's what God was establishing. When God gave this to Moses, it was very different from the pagan nations and how they meted out justice at that time. An eye for an eye. If you accidentally poke somebody's eye out before God established Israel, the people would kill you. If you accidentally knocked a tooth out, they would kill you. There wasn't like Lex Teliana. There wasn't the punishment shall match the crime. God is telling Moses, be fair, be righteous in your judgments. By the time Jesus shows up here, now the justice system, nothing new under the sun. It wasn't fair. Wealthy people would get off. Poor people doing the same thing would get locked up. Same thing, nothing new under the sun. So here's Jesus telling the people, don't try and retaliate. Seek to reconcile. That's the kingdom way to live. Now what's the deal here when he says, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek? This is interesting when you study this out because the Bible assumes... No offense to you left-handed people. The Bible assumes everybody in the Bible is right-handed. If you were left-handed, the Bible would always point out that person was left-handed. Remember Ehud? He was the judge. And so they searched him when he came in to talk to the king, this wicked king. They patted him down on this side. Why? Because a right-handed man would take his sword out. So they patted him. Oh, no, nope, he doesn't have a sword. Ehud, and then it points out he was left-handed. Pulls out his sword from here into Eglon, the king, big fat guy. Says it went into the fat, you know, just took the whole handle in. It was pretty cool. Anyway, Ehud. My son-in-law John was going to name his grandson Ehud, and I'm glad he changed his mind. Jonah works. Ehud. <laughs> That's funny. But I don't know where I'm going with this. I know where I'm going. So... Benjam the Benjamites, they were specifically mentioned. These particular Benjamites were amazing slingshot throwers. And it says they could split a hair, you know, every time. These guys were made. But it mentions that these Benjamites were left-handed. Why is that important? He's telling the people here, the only way you can get slapped on the right cheek is to be backhanded by somebody. Because if, if I'm standing in front of you and I slap with this hand, I'm hitting what side? I'm hitting your left cheek. So you'd have to go right hand, back hand. That's how you hit the right cheek. That was one of the biggest insults in that nation, in that culture, to backhand somebody. You've heard the phrase, oh, that was a backhanded compliment. That means it was an insult. That's his point here. By the way, that was trivia. <laughs> Everything Jesus tells us to do in this section, this section here, he will go through himself. He turned the other cheek, as he mentions here. They pummeled his face. They beat him. 
slapped him, beat him, punched him, pulled out his beard. They spit in his face. Jeremiah, or Isaiah says that he was marred more than any other man. In other words, he was beaten so severely you couldn't even recognize who he was. Verse 20, or 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. So it mentions the two garments that Jews would wear. They had the inner garment and the outer garment. The soldiers would take Jesus' garments, it mentions, the cloak and the tunic. And while he's hanging on the cross above them, down below, they're gambling off his clothes. Verse 41 and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Now this is a practice started by the Persians. A Persian soldier could stick his spear on your shoulder, and that was, you're going to do whatever I tell you to do. I've got all this stuff i got to carry. My donkey's tired. You're going to pick it up and carry it for me. And they could make you carry whatever burden they had as far as they wanted you to go. So when the Romans show up, they adopted that, except for the Romans said, we're going to limit it to one mile. A Roman mile is like 4,800 feet, a little less than our mile. So they would put the spear on your shoulder and say, I'm compelling you, carry my stuff for a Roman mile. So Jesus said, hey, if they compel you to go one, go with them too. Go the extra mile. That's where that phrase comes from. Do above and beyond what people ask. Be a blessing to them. That's his point here. When the Roman soldier, remember when Jesus, okay, after he's beaten, he's bloodied, he's been whipped with the cat of nine tails, he's bleeding out, he's carrying the heavy cross beam towards Golgotha where they're going to crucify him. He's starting to stumble, and the word is the Roman soldier compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross, help him carry the cross to Golgotha. He wasn't like, oh, I'll volunteer. No, when the Roman soldier put that spear on Simon's shoulder, he had to do it. And so he was compelled to help carry the cross. So whatever you do, that's the point Jesus is making. Go the extra mile, do it for the glory of God. Verse 42, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This simply means Jesus wants us to be giving people, not misers. We should be generous, giving. That's the nature and character of God. I mean, the famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul says this in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Giving is simply love in action. God could have stayed up there and said, Oh, I love all you people. You're on your own, but I love you. <laughs> We'd all be toast. But because love is an, an action, love is a verb. DC talk, love is a verb. Anyway, he gave his only begotten son, to die for us. Now, when it comes to Christians giving to other people, it doesn't mean that we're to give to anybody who asks for money. After all, the Bible has a lot to say about discernment. God doesn't want us to be manipulated. He doesn't want us to be abused by sinful people. Paul will tell the Thessalonian believers in 2 Thessalonians, if a man's not willing to work, neither shall he eat. This is important. We need to be careful in this area. Sometimes we think we're helping people, but we may actually be just enabling them. In other words, God may be trying to get a hold of their heart, but if we keep trying to rescue them and rescue them and rescue them, we can actually be getting in the way of what God's trying to do in their life. And so we need wisdom and discernment. What is God wanting us to do? He might say, give that person a buck, but he might say, no, it's going to go right into their arm or right down their throat. Be discerning. The bottom line is we need to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to give them hope that comes through Jesus. That's what we need to be giving people. Remember when Peter and John, they're walking up to the temple. It's in Acts chapter 3, and they come to the beautiful gate, and there's a guy begging for alms. Nothing wrong with that. The guy was, you know, disabled. He couldn't do anything. They'd set him there every day. And as they're coming up, Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. I'm sure if he did, he'd help the guy. 
because the guy was truly in need. He goes, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the guy was instantly healed. He needed that a lot more than he needed another shekel. He needed that more than anything. And then the guy gets saved, and then that leads to John and Peter getting beaten, locked up for a while, and then saying, well, we got to obey God rather than men. So the bottom line is, Bottom line is we need to be willing to share, but we want the person we're sharing with to become more dependent on Jesus and less dependent on us. Does that make sense? If we just make people dependent on us, we're getting in the way of what God wants to do. So there is a time and place to help for sure, but be careful. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Pause there for a moment because Jesus is quoting from Leviticus 19 verse 18. And it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where does it say, and hate your enemy? It doesn't. It doesn't say that. So why is Jesus saying this? Because that's what these Pharisees were doing. They were saying, you're to love your neighbor, but you're to hate your enemy. So they're adding to the word of God. They're guilty of adding to the word. So look at verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so this is how kids of the kingdom should live our lives in this sinful, fallen, hate-filled world. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And I'm like, even the squad? <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. AOC? Does that ring a bell? Even those people that are coming against us? Yes, pray for them. Don't just get mad. Don't just say, oh, man, I'm going to take them out. No, pray for them. Again, Jesus is the greatest example of someone who loved his enemies, even as they hung him on the cross. What's the first thing he says out of his mouth? Father, get them. No, that's what I'd say. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And never forget the fact that God loved us even when we were his enemies. That's why the gospel of Christ is such great news. He willingly laid down his life for you and me when we were enemies of God, when we were at war against the Lord, when we were dead in our sins. Here's how the apostle Paul says it. Romans chapter 5, look at these verses, verse 8 through 11. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, I'm going to wait for you to get your act together, and because you're now you're so cute and cuddly, I'm going to die for you. No, while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Notice, when we were enemies, we were reconciled through Jesus. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What is reconciliation? It means you're an enemy of God. You're at war with God, and He reconciled you. He brought you into peace through Jesus. Jesus died for you so you could be brought into peace and have the very peace of God, but be at peace with God as well. In 2 Corinthians 5, we're told that we now, as believers, have been given the word of reconciliation. We're not to go around saying, God hates you. He doesn't want anything to do with you. You're going to burn in hell, you jerk. That's not loving. That's not what Christ does for us. That's, that might be what my flesh wants to say. But no, we have the word, and then he calls it the ministry of reconciliation. We go to that person and let them know, Jesus loves you. You're a jerk, but Jesus loved you. You deserve hell, but Jesus died for you. You don't have to go to hell. I mean, we're giving them the word of hope and reconciliation as we give them the gospel of Christ. 
the apostle of love. This is how John says it, 1 John 4, verses 10 and 11. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. What does that mean? Satisfaction of God's wrath. Jesus satisfied God's wrath. You and I deserve the wrath of God, but Jesus took the wrath upon himself when he hung on the cross. He sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And Jesus is saying, this is how the Father's sons and daughters should live as well. This becomes even more real in our lives today as we see more and more people in our country becoming more and more intolerant of Christians. But again, this should cause us to bless them, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You know, when we go to uh, Northeast India and great example for me is we're doing a conference for the Muslim, former Muslim, you know, church planters there. There's about 40 former Muslims there and, you know, I'm teaching them the word and they're just being blessed and we get word as soon as we finish. One of the Muslim guys that's there at our conference, his neighbor burned down his house because he was a Christian. And he didn't like his Christian neighbor being a witness. So what do you think that former Muslim did? Did he go back and burn down the other guy's house? No. Pray for them, you know, because he's being persecuted. You witness. So Emily's right-hand man over there, his name is Shamish. And he's personally led, he's former Muslim, he's personally led over 2,500 Muslims, just one-on-one, 2,500 Muslims to Christ. By just sharing Jesus with them. It's not a battle against flesh and blood. We're, we're not waging physical warfare. It's a spiritual battle. We know Satan has brought these people into captivity. But it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe. So the example Jesus uses to show God's impartiality toward all human beings, he says here, he sends rain on the just and unjust. He makes the sun rise in the good and the evil. But oh, how wonderfully different it is when we come to Christ by faith, we enter into that glorious relationship with our Heavenly Father. That is when we can start seeing unsaved people the way God does. Not as the enemy that we need to blast. Because we were all God's enemies. But we start to see them as, maybe even as prisoners. Who need to be let loose. Who need to be set free. And again, it's the gospel that will change people's lives. They're in bondage to Satan. He's the real enemy. This is why Jesus says this, verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Yeah, no big deal. It's easy to love you guys. <laughs> it is. <laughs> For the most part, it is. We all get along. It's easy to love you. He says, don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Remember, Matthew, who's writing this gospel, was a former tax collector. And he knew firsthand how he and other tax collectors were despised by everybody. Nobody ever smiled at them. Nobody ever greeted a tax collector and said, Shalom, have a good day, my brother. No, but even the despised tax collectors would greet one another. It was probably like, hey, brother, you ready to rip off some more Jews today? I mean, that's how they greeted one another. They were just despised by the people. And so the point is, we should be ready, willing, and able to greet everyone with a genuine, hi, how are you? You know, how are you doing? Not just, okay, good. But I mean, are, are you doing okay? Are, are you seeing the Lord work in your life? Again, this is how God reached out to us before we got saved. Even when we were down and out and sinful, God sent Jesus. Finally, verse 48. <laughs> Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
Again, this is not how you get into the kingdom of heaven. This is not to the gospel. Jesus is not speaking about his sacrifice on the cross here. He's summing up God's perfect law. God's law demands perfection. You want to make it to heaven on your own? Be perfect, even as God in heaven is perfect. Again, back in verse 20, Jesus told the people that they couldn't enter the kingdom of God unless their righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees. And so the people thought, well, that's never going to happen because those guys are almost perfect. And now he totally blows their mind as Jesus says, if you want to make it to heaven, you got to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. If I was on that mountain with everybody hearing Jesus say this, I, I would be going like, that's it, I'm done. Get it over with. Throw me in the lake of fire now. I'm toast. Get it over with. But as we'll see, Jesus is simply pointing out the fact that God is perfect. God is holy. God is righteous. God's law is perfect. God's law is holy and righteous. And the only way for imperfect, unholy, unrighteous people like you and me to come into God's presence is to become perfect and holy and righteous. And when all is said and done, it's going to be crystal clear, nobody can achieve perfection and holiness and righteousness on their own. But the beauty of the gospel is Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the law, all the prophets. He became the perfect spotless Lamb of God who alone could wash away our sins, who alone took all of our sins upon Himself, who alone because he alone is righteous, and when he came alive, risen from the tomb, and he's alive right now, and he offered us a free gift of salvation, we receive Christ into our lives, he gives us, he imputes to us his very own righteousness. Period. So now, this is the incredible, incredible part of this whole thing about perfection and holiness, righteousness. When God the Father looks at me, He doesn't see the knucklehead that I still am because I'm in this body of flesh. He sees Jesus in me. He sees Jesus in you. And so the Father says, that person's holy. They're righteous. They're going to heaven because of Christ. That's it. It's not because of anything we've done, but it's all because of Jesus Christ. He sees us complete in Christ. So this is not how to get saved, <laughs> this whole Sermon on the Mount. This is showing us how you can never be saved on your own. And he's going to bring us to that point of showing us Christ has fulfilled it all. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news of Jesus according to Matthew.